Welcome, good afternoon. I don't want to say good afternoon or good evening, uh, but welcome and thank you all for fording the atmospheric river uh, to get here. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Tony Cascardi, and I'm the Dean of Arts and Humanities. And I'm really delighted to say just a few brief words of welcome um, to all of you and to express my gratitude to the Art of Writing, as you know, a program based in our Townsend Center for the Humanities and organized by Professor Ramona Nadaf, who is the program's director. You'll hear from Ramona in just a few minutes. Um, the Art of Writing dedicates itself to what is one of the most important of all the things that we as humanists and educators can do for our students, and that is to teach them the power of the English language. It's something we tend to underestimate and sometimes take for granted like clean air and water, but it actually has to be worked at and achieved. Every once in a while, we are reminded of the power of language to shape the world and even determine the course of history. And you know, it's recently been Oscar season, so I've been thinking about movies, and I can't forget uh, King George's struggle to master language and, and speech in the King's speech. Or the line, uh, it's actually in the film, I think it's spoken by a member of uh, the English Parliament and later taken up by JFK from the film Darkest Hour uh, when Churchill persuades England to enter the war against Hitler. Um, uh, and the phrase said of Churchill was that he, quote, mobilized the power of the English language and sent it into battle. We also know all too well from our current public discourse just how much we as a society, society can suffer when the very bones of our language are freighted with flimsy falsehood and subjected to the ongoing assault of crushing untruths. The art of writing is dedicated to the power of the written word and, it's commit, and it is committed to empowering our students to marshal all the resources of language ultimately in order to make the world a better place. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce and turn over the podium to Ramona de Daff, Director of Art of Writing. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, really, for your support and confidence in the art of writing. And thank, I want to thank the Townsend Center. I want to thank um, Carol and Debbie for all the organization that's gone into today. And I really have to thank my students from Rhetoric 189 and Michael Dalebout and Linda Kinsler, the graduate student instructors, who have been collaborating for two weeks to do this interview with us and even to write this introduction. And I hope you're not going to be too dismayed at the changes I made without asking you. <laughs> so before introducing our guest, Michael Lewis, I just want to take a minute to tell you about uh, the Rhetoric and Art of Writing course from which today's conversation stems. In our writing intensive seminar, we've been studying the themes of lies, liars, and post-truths. We do look at contemporary events, but our primary preoccupation has been to look at the philosophical, ethical, and political history of lying in the Western canon. As I tell my students, lies like truth have a long history, and they're going to help us understand that history, helps us to understand what is or is not going on today. In between these readings, we also have and have had and will continue to have the opportunity to learn from guest lecturers, journalists, judges, scholars, and novelists, and how their work reflects on questions of untruths. This course, I just want to say, is only possible because of the generous support of a rhetoric major alumnus, Ellis Jones, who unfortunately can't be here today. He is devoted to the power of the English language, as Tony reminded us, and he wants to make sure that our generation of students and those to follow possess the skills to write artfully, even when they're writing emails or letters or memos or technical reports, some of the forms we've been experimenting with in our class, so that when they do get into their life work, they'll know how to come up with that surprising turn of phrase that transforms understanding and belief. So it's no surprise that Michael Lewis is the writer invited here today for the Art of Writing lecture. 
He embodies how a well-developed craft of writing, a commitment to the art of storytelling and investigative reporting, the curiosity to learn, listen, and think about the world can indeed take you around the world, from finance to sports to weather and storms to friendships forged by economic interests to mentors and coaches to politics and even back again to home and family. That Lewis knows how to write and works hard at writing, and I'm shouting that out to my students, it's hard work, allows him to write, it seems, about everything and anything. In our little world of rhetoric, he would be what Socrates would have wanted the fifth century Greek sophist to be. People who actually do know about that which they speak when they speak persuasively and eloquently and I will return to the Greeks again. So today we welcome you, Michael Lewis, and I know you've taken time away from your writing to speak with us about your practice and process of writing. Now, some like to blandly describe Lewis as a, quote, former bond salesman turned author, or as a, quote, financial journalist and best-selling non-fiction author. Others, with a little bit more flourish, write, Michael Lewis has a gift. He can walk into an area already mined by hundreds of writers and find gems there all along, but somehow missed by his predecessors. My art of writing students prefer to describe him thus, and I quote, a fighter of fake news, the switch hitter of expose journalism, a one man 21st century schoolhouse rock, the Sherlock Holmes of current events, the explorer of life who discover, discovers the stories buried in cryptic numbers and bureaucracy, the listener who hears a butterfly flap its wings in China and forecasts a financial storm on Wall Street. Many more are the epitaphs and metaphors, but I'll stop there. As I already mentioned, Lewis's range of subjects is as endless as the ocean is vast. And I had an experience when I walked into a brick and mortar bookstore to ask where I could find some of Lewis's books. The bookseller looked at me really confused and almost seemed to be begging me to go back and shop at Amazon. Michael Lewis, where do you find Michael Lewis? Look at the front shelf, there's the fifth risk. What else do you want? And I said, the undoing project, for example, or the Big Short, or Moneyball, or Blindside. Where does one find those books in the tidy categories that govern the bookstore? It's indeed tempting to answer everywhere and nowhere, but the truth of the matter is that the answer is everywhere. I tend to think of Lewis as one might a microhistorian. He inve intensively investigates a very contained episode of history and in telling the individual stories of the individual characters, exposes the larger structures, institutions, systems, and questions at play. His desire seems to be, to return to the theme of our course, to document how lies affect, ruin, and destroy some lives while other lives continue to thrive without suffering. Now, I think he also likes to expose lies, but he also wants to remind us that there are people in the government who, once upon a time, and even still, care about the public good. He wants to borrow, I'm gonna borrow an expression that Lewis got from one of his informants, he wants to do a bright spot analysis on the government. And it seems he wants his readers to know and discern between the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let us begin. I'm gonna ask one question and then hand it over to my Rhetoric 189 students who will ask their own questions which they have written and revised over the past week. We'll then, if time permits, open it up to the floor and I would like to give privilege and priority to the undergraduate students since Art of Writing is, among other things, devoted to their writing and speaking skills. So thank you, Michael, for being here, and thank everyone for coming.
So before you ask your question, uh, you should have revealed that we've known each other since our 19-year-olds were three-year-olds together at a preschool. I should and have revealed what, it, and I, my students wanted me to. And your emails about this event actually could be texts for your class, because I did not expect such a grand thing. I was expecting to kind of like just see your students. This is beautiful. But I, my brain is in a state of shock, because I just walked down here from my home a half a mile away, where I was just, I just spent half an hour being ignored by my two children and my wife, and, and, and who, who could care less what I have to say, and to find this room full of people who are going to be hanging on every word. Explain that. Well, I don't know, Michael. When I invited you, I didn't realize you were such a celebrity, to be honest. I thought it wasn't going to fill up the whole Morrison yeah. Yeah, Library, yeah, yeah, yeah. so... All right. I wasn't intentionally trying to deceive you. No. <laughs> All right, so let's get going. <laughs> okay, so I want to begin by beginning with what you're doing right now with the Audible Originals. And part of what really interests me, given that I study ancient Greek culture, is that you're bringing back an old form of storytelling, the art, you're performing in oral storytelling, you're bringing back an oral culture, and you're having people listen to words. So I just want to begin by playing a clip Ooh. from The Coming Storm, your first Audible original, and um, ask you a few questions about that. All right. If I'm allowed. The Coming Storm. As she walked the path that the tornado had torn through the American town, she was struck by how hard it would have been to imagine what she was now seeing. Two days earlier, on May 22, 2011, the wind had cleaved Joplin, Missouri in two, leaving behind a lot of you-have-to-see-it-to-believe-it stuff. A rubber hose run entirely through a tree trunk, a chair sideways, all four legs piercing a wall, a giant Walmart tractor trailer thrown 200 yards on top of what had been the Pepsi building. A full-size SUV folded in half around a tree. Only the metal had been flayed from the car and the tree was no longer a tree but a tree trunk as all the trees had snapped and blown away. I felt like some giant had taken an egg beater and run it through a town, said Kathy Sullivan. It was toothpicks. Then she realized that the egg beater metaphor was not exactly right as the edges of the destruction were eerily undisturbed. What the tornado had narrowly missed was as perfectly preserved as what it had hit was perfectly eliminated. It was like when you run your finger through the icing on top of a cake, she said, a clean line of total destruction. So I know that's the beginning. Um, I wish I could play the end too, which is unbelievable. But um, I want to talk to you about, I know you ended up publishing this in print, but how, First of all, did you choose or decide that you wanted to start using this oral genre? How has your writing process and cha style changed or not? And do you have a new audience in mind? Um, and when you read, and you read so beautifully, um, do you have to think about whether your metaphors are more or less complex? Do you have to think about whether your sentences are shorter? Do you have to make your character development more central, more complex? Just tell us about this oral about the, and written experience. So it's been, it's been interesting because I'm doing it right now again. Uh, the next thing that you'll see from me is a, a podcast series, which has been a year in the making, wh which is it's narrative storytelling. It's seven episodes, but it's an odd thing. What I'm doing with the form is a little odd in that it really is a book. It, it's, a, it's all around a single theme. So it builds and builds and builds. I'm just I'm doing it right over here in the Berkeley Journalism School. Uh, I'm taping it there. The so how I got into the first into this in the first place is a little accidental and more driven by market forces than any kind of like creative insight. Um, the magazine business in this country is collapsing. The the market for long form journalism is collapsing. Um, it, it's uh, Vanity Fair, where I was where was my home for the last decade. Uh, the editor moved on. It, I smelled change that didn't feel good to me. They, mm. they, among other things, they let go of my editor who I'd worked with for a decade, and I really wanted to keep working with him. At the same time, 
Audible has arisen as this force in the market. And the audio book and the podcast, this is what's going on right now right. In, in reading. Um, Audible, the, the company Audible, which now owned by Amazon, is more profitable and has been for five years now, more profitable than all the New York publishers combined. And they have vast resources. And they've been, they've been kind of after me for a, four or five years to come do an audio original. And I thought, I use the magazine work for kind of R&D for books. And so my first thought was, I'll just move the magazine work into there. And I'll use that, I'll use that as R&D. And I didn't even think, oh, it's going to be a really different experience. Mm. Um, but when I got into writing the first one, it was a little bit of a different experience. Uh, and I wasn't as sensitive to the difference uh, in the genre as I probably should have been. But what clearly works is simpler language, mm -hmm. shorter sentences, powerful characters, uh, narrative, first person and humor work really well. Um, and in the podcast I'm finding, when, you actually, you, when you're actually trying to sound as if you're speaking, as opposed to if you've written it. Mm. So the audibles, it really is, um, I'm reading a written work. And it, the, the, what I had to do to it, to take it from what you just heard to the printed word, wasn't that much. Mm. But with the podcast, I really want to sound like I'm talking to you. And we don't, you, don't speak in, you don't speak in complete sentences. You, you may kind of technically speaking, you speak in complete sentences. Most, but most people don't. That's um, because of rhetoric. Yeah, that's Our right, rhetoric that's right. students speak and you, in you, complete you have, it, Just as you've thought more about what I do than I have. But, but the... Well, I uh, wish I could write sentences like but, you. But, <laughs> but when you're speaking, even when you're speaking a complete sentence, if you listen, you're breathing. You're pausing in the middle of it. And, and so when you write that, it's very, it, when you write it well to read it, Mm. It, it, it's very choppy uh, and faux casual, informal. What I found with this first piece um, is when people listen to something, they feel a different connection to it than when they read it. Mm. it and I, I, it's, I, I think it's more emotional. I think emotions are gonna, I, my, my hunch with this, with this form, with Audible going forward, is to look for very emotional content rather than kind of analytical, cerebral stuff. Emotional content, uh, and if I can do it in the first person, do it in the first person. Wow. Uh, I'm not gonna always be able to do that, but that's, that's where I'm kind of headed with it. Um, so that, that is a big change for you to bring the I more present. Well, you, you know, say? I've done that a lot in my own writing, but it's just that it, when I think about what I would do for Audible, we're playing around with, 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 with topics. They're things I know I want to write about right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are just better suited to print than they are to this. And some of them are really better suited to this. So I want to write something about teaching my children about money, my, especially my 12-year-old son. I've been keeping <laughs> receipts now for 19 years, or almost 19 years, whatever. 14 years since they started buying stuff. Wow. And, and, uh, and there are a lot, I've never really bothered to sit down and explain to them how money works. And that it's going to, I can already tell it's going to be kind of funny and it's personal. And that's probably going to work for Audible. On the other hand, I've got another idea that grew out of the, the book I just published where I want to explore sort of remote risks that are becoming less remote because Trump is in an office, mm -hmm. and the kind of things he might do uh, that would just, you know, push his TV drama forward. And um, the, I come to view him as a kind of a trust-destroying machine, that wherever he goes, he undermines trust. He, he did it in his business life, and he's done it as a politician. He's undermined trust in the media. He's undermined trust in the electoral process. He's undermined trust uh, between uh, us and our allies overseas. And I kind of ask, I'm going to ask in this piece, well, what's left for him to undermine? Like, is it, it, as this machine moves through the world. And one of the obvious things that's left is, um, is, is faith in the dollar and, and faith in the credit worthiness of the United States. Right. And I want to explore what happens if he starts. And I, there are ways he might very easily undermine it. And that's something that's, to, I'm going to have to explain some complicated things. Mm. I can tell that's going to be much better for print. So when you say you're going to have to explain, so that's why it's better for print? It's because so there's I think the be... big short would, is a harder audio uh, experience than it would be a, 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 a reading experience. Um, because I don't think you can listen to my explanation of a CDO 
and, and get it. I think you need to be able to kind of look back. A few, yeah. uh, you can go over it a couple of times. And you don't think you're capable of making that explanation I, I think, I think, into I think there are things, audible prose? It's sort of like cooler material is going to work well on the printed page. It worked better on the printed page. Now, having said all this, I'm sort of like drifting, wanting to drift towards hotter material anyway. Mm. So it's nice to go into this form. And it's nice to be pushed and pulled. And you know what else is interesting is when you, when you, have, to, when you have to read it aloud, um, you, you hear things that you just never would hear if all you're doing is listening to your, the voice inside your head as you're reading it on the page. Um, so as I was reading it, uh, I edited it. And this happens with the podcast too. You just you just hear stuff, and I, I, I didn't realize. When I thought back in the old days, back with Liars Poker, very first, beginning of my career, um, the audiobook was such a trivial part of the market that no one hired actors to read them or anything. Like the authors read them, uh, and I can remember when I read the first couple of books, wanting to take a pen to it. But it never registered to me that I actually should have taken it. I should have read it aloud before I put it in print. Hmm. And now I'm going to read everything aloud before I put it in print. Um, but this, you know, it's interesting, this. Yeah. People are listening to, uh, the phone has just changed everything, right? No, it's a whole new sonic world. And there get, are all these sonic platforms. And you can hit a button, you can get whatever you, you want to listen to up. And uh, it's changed. It's not just my writing life with my son, my 12, with Walker, my 12-year-old. I used to read to him, and now we listen to stuff together. We're listening to Huckleberry Finn on the way to school every morning. We just finished with Gulliver's Travels. And, he's, and I never get him to read that kind of stuff, but he'll listen to it and take it all in uh, and sort of sift it. Uh, it's a, it, and you're right. It's, like, it's not a radical thing to be doing. It's the beginning of the form, right? The, the, you know, Homer wasn't writing it down. Nope. He was, and he was talking it. And it, it is when you, when you talk it, you do realize, you do realize um, that you that you have that you have to keep the, per, the person you're talking to interested. When you're writing, you kind of don't realize it, and uh, and you can see this by most of what is written. That the, the the author has forgotten that there's someone there who's reading it, and it's just kind of for himself. Uh, but when you're when you when you have the minute you start speaking it, you realize, oh, that is so it's boring, it's wrong, it's you know but you do just you, you start to a particular listener when I mean like or is that listen when you say you know I have no, to no, be, I mean, do you have a no, no no when I'm actually sitting there reading it to a studio fill with you know audible oh, okay. executives and my editor. It's a different experience than handing it over and having them read it and come back and lie to me about how great it is. Uh, I can look at their faces and see, oh, not so great. Uh, and I can also feel, you also feel it. You feel it in the way you feel when you start a story at a dinner party and everybody's tuning out. Uh, you, you just, the, it's, and you know, a lot of my favorite writers tested their material this way. Mark Twain would test all of his stuff on stage. So did Flaubert read all his prose at I didn't know that. On Sundays, he had his friends come over. And he would read it. And he would God, read he it, and that's, and that's how he, yeah. we'll talk about yeah, that yeah, later. Yeah. But that's how he would do part of his editing. He would scream out his prose and hear the rhythms and do the editing to his two friends. But this is a beautiful time, if you don't mind if I transition, and we start with sure. our first question from McKees. Um, it's going to take you back to another time of life, Michael. <laughs> I guess I'll start out by saying thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is McKees, like Professor Nodoff said. In the Vanity Fair article you wrote on Tom Wolfe, you described him as the leading journalistic observer and describer of American life in a time of radical cultural transformation. I'm curious. Um, how did Tom Wolfe and others influence your style of writing? So before I answer the question, did you make these poor people read all my stuff? No. I, mean, I, I thought maybe so you... So you obviously didn't read all my emails. No, no, I didn't. No, I, I, I got the gist of it. You wanted me to well, come over here and do you, something. I, did I couldn't tell you no. I did and, write. I, did, I told you what they read, but that's all okay. All right, you read Tom Wolfe? So you read the Tom no, Wolfe No, no, they did. Well, you went ahead and read it yourself. You know, they, my students are kind of remarkable. Okay, so you did it all by yourself. All right, so. Uh, they go read by themselves. 
<laughs> so, and you inspired them to do that. I just want to let you know. There you go. All right. <laughs> so, so the um, if I had come up in a different sort of way as a writer, the answer would be more straightforward. I did not grow up thinking I was going to be a writer. I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I, not only did I not know anybody who had written a book, I didn't hardly knew anybody who read a book. And, uh, and it, it, my father was a great exception, but it was, not, it was not an intellectual environment. And the idea that I would write, I mean, it was it been a preposterous idea to me that I would be a writer. I had no interest in this writing for the school newspaper. I didn't do that in college. So when I read, and I read, I was absorbed by what I read from a pretty young age. I loved, I loved to read, but I loved to read what I wanted to read, and I was not a good student. I was not an interested student. I found my teachers uneven, and I'd, often when they assigned it, I assumed it was dull if they assigned it. Not always, but some, sometimes it worked. But, so I was, not, I was not consciously learning how to write from people I read at that age, and Tom Wolfe, he was important to me because, because it really was true that my father had this, these shelves of books, and I, I used to think when I'd come home from school and they'd assign whatever they'd assign for me to read, uh, that it, that was homework. And what my parents had on their shelves was what, the kind of the illicit stuff that would be fun to read. And some of it was genuinely illicit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it, was, it was racy enough that I would kind of grab it and go read that. And there was this odd book called uh, Radical Chic. Um, the little paperback that my father had by Tom Wolfe, and I had, n I had no idea who he was. In fact, when I picked it up, at that, up to that point, I must have been 12 or 13, I actually didn't have a sense that a person wrote the book. You know, I read the Hardy Boys series. Who wrote that? I have no idea, well, nor do I care. And, and I didn't care, I didn't go looking for authors. Uh, I just read books about stuff that interested me. When I read this, the voice was so strong on the page, and it was so funny. And I, it was about the Black Panthers being invited to a cocktail party on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And I did, barely knew who the Black Panthers were. I certainly didn't know the host of the guy. I didn't know anything about it. And yet, I, just, I remember rolling around on the floor laughing at this thing. And it occurred to me for the first time when I was reading it, someone wrote this. Like a person. Who is this? And I flipped this. You know, Tom Wolfe. You know, there's an author. It's such a thing. And that was my first kind of realization that like a person did this. Um, and so it's, it stuck with me. Uh, and I, would re I read everything he wrote and eventually figured out that people wrote the other books too. Uh, and Wolf, it was odd because Wolf stayed in my life. Uh, when my first book came out, he wrote me a note and said he'd love to have lunch. And we became friends. Uh, but so, so to answer your question, about, the, about his effect on how I, I write. When you discover it when you're young, I think this is true, when you're young and you, you discover a writer whose voice sort of occupies your head, you imitate it. So when I first started to write, which was basically the moment I got out of college, I started to write magazine articles and submit them willy-nilly to, to, to uh, publications, and they were, always, they were rejected for two or three years, I probably sounded a lot like Tom Wolfe because I loved the way he sounded on the page. I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. I knew I was kind of, the, the trick was finding your own voice. Um, but the, the, some of it's still in there somewhere. And there are four or five other writers who had the same sort of effect, where at, some, at different points in the very early stages of my career, I, I kind of I consciously or unconsciously was kind of imitating them. Uh, and so some of that sticks. I'd say the, 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 law, the big thing that sticks, though, is just associating the printed word with laughter and entertainment and this total kind of engagement and sort of expecting that of the things I wrote. Uh, so he was important for me in, in that way. And it was a joy. To, I mean, it was great. That article you read, uh, I, I wrote, so what happened was I didn't think he was long for this world. And he, I was right. He died what, last year. Uh, and uh, he had given his papers to the New York Public Library. Mm. And he, it turned out he'd done what I do, is that he didn't really have papers. What he had was cardboard box every year. This is what I do too. I have these folders. One is for my taxes, and one is just 
all correspondence, anything that interests me, uh, any, something I clip out of the newspaper and it just piles up you know, every year and then I toss it in a box and I toss it in the basement and it go, I have these going back for 30 years. Yeah. And he, he had them going back to childhood. And he never bothered to even, he didn't got, ever bother to sift them. He just dumped them all in the public library and they gave him $6 million for them. And I thought, I got I to be the first one to go through those. Did you do and, that? You, I did, you, so I went and spent days in the public library going through this. And, I, and then I went to him and I said, do you have any idea the things you wrote and said when you were you know, a graduate student at Yale? And he was appalled. He, he was shocked. He's like, anyway, get that out of there kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, so it was an opportunity to go back. That piece was an opportunity for me to thank him, to go, to go and use his papers as an excuse to write a thank you note to the person who first kind of engaged me with the idea that person could make another person feel this way w w when, when they wrote something. Thank you. Julia? Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Juliet Pasquale, and I have a question about your 2018 article, Has Anyone Seen the President? Um, great title. Uh, and in this article, you talk about feeling like you're masquerading as a proper journalist. So my question is, what then makes a proper journalist? And if you don't consider yourself to be one, then what kind of writer do you think you are? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, I've long had an, the imposter problem in my life. I, I, I'm shocked that I find myself here talking to you about my books. I never had that, you know, I, I sort of ended up in a role I never imagined quite for myself. Um, the, the reason I felt like an imposter was what happened was I've got a friend who runs Bloomberg Editorial, and he's really a literary editor. Um, and we have an agreement, in part just so we can spend some time together every year, is that every year I'll go do one essentially big travel piece for him, but a curious form of travel. And I said, let me travel as like a Martian to Washington. And, he, get, and get, he got me a White House press pass, so I was part of the White House press pool, and a pass to go through Congress, and a ticket to the State of the Union address, and all that, and write about Trump's Washington. And I really was an imposter in the White House press room. I mean, the, the, all those people are living this daily existence, and are, they, they, they know, it's like walking into a church that you, whose religion you don't practice. Um, you don't know the rituals. You don't, you don't know the questions you're meant to ask to move the ball forward. I was supposed to ask a question. You know, that's on television. And the kind of things I wanted to ask, like, is the hair real? You know, they, they, that, that kind, the kind of things that you, nobody ever asks. Like, nobody ever asks. Who's he sleeping with? You know, he's sleeping with somebody. I don't know who. Uh, uh, you know, the, it, it, it's, can he say something that's true? Like, tell me, has he read a book? Has he read a book? Name a book. One book. Um, th I mean, these are questions that were on, those are the questions that are on my mind about this guy. Not like, uh, like, uh, will we care about the exchange rate about the, between the dollar and the, and the Chinese currency? You know, that kind of stuff just does not interest me. One of our students did want to know if you had one question to ask Trump, what would you ask him? And you're obviously telling us what you would ask him. If it was just me and him in a room? Oh, well, sure. Yeah, like, so you used to just, like, sleep with everybody, and now it seems like you can't sleep with anybody, and your wife doesn't like you. What's going on in there? Uh, and how's that feel? And because I think, he, I think it's channeled into Twitter. I think, I think that what we're seeing there is a sexual impulse uh, that's been displaced. Um, in the wee and, small in the wee hour, morning. In the small hours of the morning. He wakes up, and he's just sort of punching on stuff. Uh, but, so I'd probably ask him that. But he... Um, uh, but that would just be the start, I would hope, of a long conversation. Uh, so, so, the, so, um, uh, so I was genuinely an imposter, and I didn't want the White House press people thinking that I thought I belonged there, because I didn't really belong there, and they were very sweet to let me in. Uh, but in addition, just as a device, it's often very useful to let the reader walk in with you. And, and you not being the all-knowing person who's telling them how it all is, instead they're following you, the ignorant person, into this world and can learn with you. It frees up the reader to be ignorant. Uh, so it was, it was true that I was an imposter, but it was also helpful that I was an imposter. Mm. We would call that 
There's a, a word? rhetorical strategy. There you go. Right? It's a rhetorical there strategy. <laughs> so but that's that's probably there are real strategies, right? For for well, it's how you're teaching us making the reader want to be there. Right. Right. It, 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 I think it's a very funny thing that a lot of writers, in some way, don't want the reader to want to be there. They they don't they they want they want the relationship on a be on different terms. They want to be here. They want to be speaking down to you, uh, and. I, I've never enjoyed that relationship. Uh, I told you, I stopped doing this, yeah. except funerals and graduation speeches. Uh, I, I'd rather just talk to people. And I think that that's one of my strategies for that attitude for kind of just engaging the reader. And it's funny, when you, when you, stop, when you, just, when you stop being the expert and you just become the trying to explore, I'm trying to explain it to myself, it's amazing first how much you, you see how little you understand about the thing. Uh, when you, uh, uh, if you stop presuming you understand it, and how much easier it is to help the reader to understand it. Uh, that I think the, the, one of the few things that my editor, at, I have the same editor for all my books. He's edited my books since I was 27 years old, wow. and he's still editing my books. I talked to him today. Um, he doesn't have, he himself is a little perplexed by my career, like how did that happen? Uh, I mean, he's a nice, he's sort of like, you're a nice guy and all that, but it's kind of a miracle you've come so far. And, because he, he saw me in the beginning. And uh, you ask him to explain it. One of the things he says is he, you don't, I don't make the reader feel stupid. And a lot of his authors do. Uh, and then it's a, it's, it's, I don't want the reader to feel stupid. I don't want the reader to care all that much if they think I'm, about whether, they, I don't care that much whether they think I'm smart. I'd rather them think I'm not boring. That's, that's sort of the ambition. Mm -hmm. Not bore, not suck, and not, not, not impress them. And I think there's an element to a lot of writers, it's a status thing. They're writing, they always were writing because they wanted to impress people. Uh, and that's a different place to come from. Mm -hmm. I came from a place where, I was panicked for a brief stretch when I got out of college about what I was going to do for a living. And I asked, what do I really enjoy doing when I'm doing it? I forget that it's work. And I actually enjoyed writing. It just didn't occur to me you would do it for, well, anyone would do it for a living. Uh, so it's the pleasure that starts me going uh, rather than any kind of relationship I want with the audience. That's Is that more of an answer something. that you wanted? I, so I, we have all these questions here, so I just want to warn you. Well, I just, I, you know, I, I'm very good at burning up clock. I'm like the old North Carolina offense, a basketball offense. Oh, good. Four, I was I hoping we'd so, get I, some if you sports want me, metaphors if you know, here. But if, you want me to, but if you want me to keep my answers brief, I will keep my well, answers Well, I'll brief. tell you when I need them to okay. be briefer. Okay, all right. Because we, we have to keep an eye on the hour. Right. <laughs> Thank you again so much for coming. My name is Addie. And in our class on lying, we read a book called The Lifespan of a Fact by Jim Fingal where he emphasized the importance of complete accuracy in purely nonfiction writing. However, it seems to me in some of your books, such as The Big Short or The Fifth Risk, that a different kind of prose may be necessary in order to, as you said, convince the reader of the possibility of risks that they have never experienced, such as the 2008 financial crisis or President Trump armed with a nuclear arsenal. So going off what you just said about wanting to be interesting to your readers, my question is, how as a writer do you determine the threshold for when rhetorical devices such as metaphor, hypotheticals, hyperbole, transition into being dishonest? Yeah, it's, it's like an impossible question to answer. Uh, but but um, I don't actually think that what I write is inaccurate. I don't, so I'm not thinking that, that it's OK to be inaccurate. Uh, but. The facts alone, I mean, they're not going to get you anywhere. Uh, and you can actually brew the facts up into a concoction that's totally false. The, 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 the fact checking is often done at the expense of sense checking. Uh, like, does this actually make any sense? All your facts are right, the names, the dates, uh, but, but you're actually not making sense. Um, and I worry more about sense. They're fact checkers. I mean, everything I write gets fact checked by uh, every which way. Because if I make a mistake, I'm going to hear about it from a million people. Uh, and I do make mistakes, but they're not intentional. They're not useful. Um, 
I don't think, oh, that'd be great if I just lie about this. It's going to get my, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's going to make my story work better. Uh, but I am much more concerned about like figuring out what the truth of the matter is generally, and then like worrying about getting all the facts right. Um, but you, you, I don't get, so I think there's a false distinction. Like there's, that there's, there's um, this factual stuff and then there's entertaining stuff. It's just not true. Uh, there's, there's uh, factual stuff is very entertaining. Wolf, Tom Wolf was this way. He was, obs- that, that, that um, he was an obsessive reporter. Uh, he kind of lived the story. And I try to do that too. I try to immerse myself so that in ways that aren't really natural, so I really understand and know the thing I'm writing about, so that it is true. Um, and so let's take a, I'm trying to, I wish I had like a book with me now, but because when you're descri- you read a newspaper, uh, this isn't fair to the newspaper because sometimes it's very good, but read a story where the characters are not actually known by the writer. All they've done is like talk to them on the phone for 20 minutes and, or, or seen them for 20 minutes and they describe their hair color and like some odd body movement and that's, or they do something to try to make, him, make the person a character and then they leave it at that. And you have no sense of who this person is. Um, and it's all factually accurate, but you've actually delivered a false portrait mm-hmm. of, of you know, no real sense of who this person is. In or, I find in order to get across a person, I have to go live with them, sometimes move into their house. I've done that with subjects. I did it in The Blind Side. I did it in The New New Thing. Uh, Billy Bean wouldn't let me move in for Moneyball because he's not <laughs> that kind of guy. He thought we'd think that was a little weird. But, uh, but, but we spent a lot of intimate time together. And, uh, and so I think, I think like, uh, it's really true. We do live in an age where you can make up a lie and it can travel the world and, and be believed by whoever wants to believe it and it never gets corrected. Um, but th- that's a different thing than, than, than the world, than what I, where, where I'm coming from, where I live. I try, I'm trying to get it all right. I, but I'm not obsessing about the facts. I'm obsessing about the sense of the matter. Sloan. Hi. Um, thank you again so much for coming. My name's Sloan. Um, in class, we've also been talking about Plato's noble lie and sort of how the idea of lying in pursuit of political power reemerges in Machiavelli's The Prince. Um, reading Have You Seen the President, particularly the portion where you watch the State of the Union with Steve Bannon, reminded me how you have to constantly evaluate the integrity of your interviewees and their possible political agenda. So in that vein, how do you assess information from political operatives like Steve Bannon without projecting your own expectations? You mean, how do I detect bullshit? <laughs> I guess I mean, so, that, this yeah. Is true. This isn't just in politics. You don't need Machiavelli and the Prince yeah. for this. I mean, you get, it, you, get it from, you get this from every person you write about. Uh, so the, f- the first thing you do is you realize just generally, everybody, if I walked into your life and said, you know, I showed up at your dorm and you didn't know who I was, and I'd say, I'm Michael Lewis, I'm the author, and I hear you're a really interesting person, I'm writing a magazine piece about you. I promise you the first 24 hours of our relationship would not be an honest relationship. It wouldn't be, you wouldn't be giving me an honest view of yourself. You would be spinning me every which way and, because you would be concerned about how you were going to appear. Uh, and so uh, you, gotta, you have to worry about this with everybody you write about. So the first answer is you immerse yourself in the lives of the people you write about to the point where they just, you wear them down. They do not have the energy to lie to you anymore. <laughs> and uh, they, they just, I, okay, you're gonna figure you get to know me, it's too late, I can't do anything about it. You're gonna get to know me, here it is. I, I, I get that when I'm writing about someone in a detailed way, when they're a big character, that always happens, that I, I have to do that, that kind of work. When I'm using Steve Bannon uh, as, for a scene, um, almost whatever he did, I, I control. So what I do is like, I decided it was more interesting watching the State of the Union with the person who created Donald Trump, than, or helped create Donald Trump, uh, than it was to be in the actual State of the Union. So instead of going into the Capitol with my ticket, I called up Bannon and I said, I want to come over to your house and sit, sit with you on the sofa and watch it. 
And I had already met him before that. Uh, and he said, unbelievably to me, sure. Uh, and, and he is, uh, someone like that, for something like that, was, is actually, he's actually very well suited to that sort of casual um, scene creation. In that he's, un, he's pretty unfiltered. I mean, he's saying, he's saying stuff all the time he shouldn't be saying. And, uh, and he's, not think, he's not like diabolically clever in how it's going to play. His cleverness is in realizing that if he were just like out there with me, I'd like him. I didn't expect to like him. Uh, I really didn't expect to like him. And I didn't expect him to be so interesting to me. Uh, but to the extent he was like trying to spin me about something, he wasn't actually. In the, I don't remember him actually even trying to persuade me or anything. He thinks of me as like this libtard, uh, you know, this, this, from Berkeley. And he, he thought I was all right because he liked liar's poker. Uh, he thought it was funny. But I mean, he was perfectly aware that, I, that we didn't agree on very much. Uh, so there wasn't, a, there wasn't that feeling in the room. I, now, there is that feeling in the room. I did cover a presidential election back in 96. And everybody on the, on the big campaigns, the Dole and the Clinton campaign, they just lied from the beginning. They opened their mouths to the, 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 the time they shut their mouths. Everything was like just phony. And you smell that, and you just don't put it in print. You know, it's, it's not even interesting in print. Huh. The interesting stuff about Bannon was you read it on the page, and you thought, yeah, he actually thinks that. You know, he, when, when, uh, uh, he was so absorbed. Melania walks in in a white, the suffragette white, white. He's just forgotten I'm in the room. He goes, boom, suck on that. You know, and, and it's, it's like, he's like, that's not for me. That, that's just because he's like, he can't control himself. Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, that, that's just the way he is. Uh, and for that, per, for, so that's very useful to have a character like that in that kind of situation. I didn't have to get to know him all that well to kind of get him on the page, Who I think, honestly. Who would be the opposite to Bannon that you've had to deal with, that you had to kind of break down their resistances and the reserve? So the most important person whose life I ever really moved into was Obama's. And... But Obama, does, Obama is so comfortable with himself. He was, he was like, he's a lot like Bannon. You just, you, except, you, except you kind of approve of him. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, it's, it's, uh, but in the sense that you feel like you're with the person. And, and you, you sense that um, where with Billy Bean, it took me a few weeks to feel like I was with a person who was just being himself, uh, with Obama and with Bannon right away. And there wasn't any difference uh, there isn't any different when I see when I, I've seen Obama recently. He's just no different than when he was the first time I walked into the Oval Office and sat down with him to start talking. Uh, so the he's there are people there are people who you would think would be hard to break down because they're president of the United States, uh, and they aren't. The, and the people who the people who I've made who become important in books of mine, who were really hard to break down. Billy Bean was probably high up on the list. Uh, he he didn't, doesn't like being watched. Really doesn't. And he's really smart. He's very evasive. He's, he's, um, he fears being trapped. In a, he's, ne he's always looking to avoid being cornered. And what I was doing was cornering him. And, and so I, I felt this constant, like, uh, the uh, Michael Orr in the middle of the blind side. Now, I had constructed the narrative, so you intentionally were not hearing his voice. You were hearing all the voices about him. And you, I only wanted him to walk on stage with a voice at the very end. But it was, but he, you know, he was 16 years old or 17 years old. That's a, so he had an excuse. But he was terrified of me from right, and I never got, never got beyond that. I never got really, got, I never really felt like I got through to the him. Uh, but because I didn't really completely, it would have been nice to have him. I didn't really need him. Uh -huh. I didn't want to make him that miserable, so I didn't push it. But I, there are plenty of people who, like, in the course of, of, of doing a piece of journalism I need to talk to, who I sense have got some wall up. And I, but I just don't, if I don't really need to burst through the wall, I just move on because it's too much trouble. Uh, but but uh, there's always a little bit. You know, it's funny. The, um, 
trying to get people on the page, people have, they present. They, 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 they have a sense of how they want to be seen. And they're very self-conscious with, with they're self-conscious in a social situation. They're really self-conscious when a, a writer is in their lives. Um, and I found that two things are really useful. One is if you kind of include them in the process, you start to explain to them how you see them. They start to relax. They might disagree, but they at least see what you're thinking. And the second thing is, um, look where they don't think you're looking. Um, I was an art history major at Princeton. And there were a couple things I picked up in art history that never occurred to me at the time. They'd be useful to me in my career. But that I've transferred pretty neatly into my writing career. And one of them was the way Bernard Berenson, when he, he was the great um, connoisseur of Italian paintings in the late 19th, early 20th century, who, who classified a lot of the, the Italian Renaissance paintings, attributed them and then sold them off, made a fortune by discovering a Leonardo and selling it to a robber baron. Um, that, that he had a method of trying to determine who painted what. It's actually maybe even more usefully applied to getting at char people's character, oh. character. And it is, if you're looking at a picture of, um, of uh, Mary and, and Jesus, if you're looking at a, a Madonna, uh, pay no attention to the face of Jesus or the face of the Virgin, because the painter was very self-conscious about it. And that's where he's leased himself. Look at the toenails, because he wasn't even thinking about it. And, and you'll find that no two painters paint the toenails the same way. So if you look at, if you look at your subjects, so I, Ramona, oh, if no, I, it, no, I'm not gonna make you do it, <laughs> but I bet if I took off those boots yeah. and I looked at your toenails, I'd learn something about you. Well, and, yeah. and, and, uh, and so I, often, I have very sturdy feet. No, that I bet that, like for example, does your nail polish match your toenail polish? Or <laughs> you're getting uncomfortable, but that's exactly, but that's I'm exactly. I'm getting uncomfortable because I haven't had a pedicure for a long <laughs> there you time. Well, so that's, there, but if you start looking where in seemingly kind of trivial, yeah corners of the person's life, you start seeing things about them. And sometimes you can use that to open up the bigger parts oh. of their lives. And it, that would, I, I would imagine it would make people freeze. Yeah. <laughs> no, they don't know you're doing it. For the oh. longest time, you, don't, you look and look and look and you take the notes, you don't share all that uh, until you've kind of gotten more comfortable with them. Uh, but so, um, so anyway, uh, the, the, I don't know what led us down this path, but with this, with like with Bannon. We were talking about Bannon. About reserve. Okay. Neil, we'll come back. Um, do you, why don't you ask your question? We have three more questions, and then we'll open it up. Or I, I'm looking at the time here. Hi, and thank you for being here today. Given your experience with President Trump's inner circle, how do you imagine the differences between how he communicates with his close associates as opposed to the general public? Uh, so I don't have that. The only people in his inner circle that I've spent much time with were Chris Christie and Steve Bannon. Um, a couple of other lower people who were kind of lower in the, in the hierarchy. Um, he's... You know, he's profane in, in private. I mean, he's just cursing a blue streak. Um, I, I, don't, I, he's, I don't think he has, um, like, I don't think there's a, like this diabolically clever brain there that you're not seeing when he's in public, that, that he's, he's expressing in private, that impress all the people around him. Uh, Bannon's, Bannon said, he's an idiot. You know, he's, a, he's, a, he's like an animal. Um, uh, they did, the people who are close to him aren't like impressed by him. Uh, so I, if he, I think he's just like, he's probably, he just, he, so he's not, I don't think he is all that different in private than he is in public. Uh, I don't think there's like a, a lot of nuance there. And if you're, like you're asking, is there, is there some hidden quality that's to, to explain all this? I think you're looking in the wrong place. I think the hidden quality is in us, not in him. Uh, <laughs> So. Thanks, Mr. Lewis, for being here. My name is Abhi. Uh, as you probably know, Steven Pinker has argued um, in his book that we are living in safer and freer times. However, you are saying that um, you, cho you have chosen to focus on short-termism, which is essentially the sacrifice of long-term uh, 
long-term security for short-term gains. So since I'm a debater, I'm curious to know that if you were to have a debate with Steven Pinker, what would you have to say about your worldview to him? I'd probably say I surrender, because <laughs> I know Steven Pinker, and he'd just win. Uh, uh, but but I, I, no, I think, I think I find Steven Pinker's general, the thrust of his last couple of books has been the world's getting better. You know, we, that, that we're surrounded by all this pessimism, but there are all these reasons for optimism. Um, and I don't disagree with that. Uh, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't pick, choose to debate him on that topic. Uh, so you, but you ask another question in there, and that is sort of like the consequences of this myopia uh, that this society in particular suffers from. And you see it everywhere. It's been the sub, it was the subject of the big short, uh, for sure. It was like in short term, in, the, people were incentivized to do things for short term gain that were really stupid for, for their long term pros, prospects. Um, and you see in the fifth risk that, that with our attitude towards our government, if you like the themes in the Trump administration, but it's not just the Trump administration. The Trump administration is like the perfect expression of it. One of the themes is anywhere you can compromise long-term interests for seeming short-term gain, go ahead and do it, because people aren't noticing it. They aren't paying any attention to it. Uh, that's a problem, but uh, I find I've been surprised by this book. I, people are receptive to, this, to it and to this pro-government argument, this argument not just about the caliber of the people who are there, which surprises people, but also the necessity of it in places they don't, they don't normally acknowledge the necessity of it, like basic research in science. Um, I'm, waiting, I, I'm waiting for the candidate, and it's gonna be in the, a Democrat, who can successfully sell the government, the long-term mission of the government. And, and instead of shying away from the conversation, or instead of, like the Republicans do, attacking the government, uh, actually embracing the government as something to be sold to the people, as a solution. And I think we're not that far away from that. I think Trump is leading us there in a funny way, by, by the way he's mismanaging So let's just say that person does emerge in the next year. Or would you write a book about, about the person? Yes. Depends on who it was. I don't know. No, but if it, that general um, idea that someone is going to transform the way we think about government and what you just said. Well, you know, when I think about book subjects, they really aren't, you know, it counts against subjects in my mind if they're obvious. So it really counted against this last book, that it was kind of an obvious thing to do, to walk into the federal government with the Trump is kind of not even intentionally dismantling. I think he's just not interested. Is I think is the first is the, he's interested in himself, and there's this thing he's supposed to be running, but it's a nuisance. Um, and he so the I like subjects that and people who you haven't heard before of before. So if some candidate for the presidency emerges who is gaining traction, uh, the whole world's gonna be watching him or her, I hope her, but, uh, and I, I'd, it'd be unlikely that I would move in and write a book about that. So um, you don't feel like you would have the capacity of finding an angle that other writers perhaps would not necessarily, like you just told us to look in the place. I, look at, I, try, I try to look in the places other people aren't looking. Right. The non-obvious thing about the fifth risk is that when I went into the government, I went to the Commerce Department, the Agriculture Department, and the Energy Department, which no one's paying attention to. And that was looking at the fingernails and the toenails. Um, but but and that saved the story. Uh, there's no point in me kicking around in, with exactly the same material that is in the front, on the front page of the newspaper every day. There's no need. Uh, so I'd be surprised if I was if I ended up writing a book about someone who was running for president. Uh, that that didn't feel right. I, I did the closest I got to that was writing a piece about Obama, mm. and that was interesting to me because there seemed to me a really simple story that just really wasn't getting told in the newspapers. Uh, and it was what it feels like to sit in that chair. Everybody's guessing about, and speculating about why you're doing what you're doing and telling you to do this or that. And they have no idea of the constraints you're operating under. They have no idea of uh, the complexity of the decisions you're making. They have no idea that you have considered everything that, that 
everyone else has recommended every which way uh, and made decisions for good reasons. It might not end up being the right decision, but, uh, and instead people are kind of presuming you're this ideologue or this dope or uh, this, and he was such this, he was, he was such the right person to do that with because he was this kind of detached, neutral observer, decision maker, just trying to figure out what the right thing was and he, perplexed by the madness of the world around him. So, so that, inter that very simple story, what it was like to be him, uh, interested me. But then that was kind of obvious. But, but it was, that's the exception to my writing. All of it's pretty kind of not obvious book subject. When I, t I say, as a rule, it's a very good sign for me when you ask me what I'm writing, that when I tell you, your eyes glaze over. Like, really? Like, really? Like, uh, the Oakland A's? If I told you I was writing, I did tell people I was writing a book about the Oakland A's, and, and the look I got back was, God help you, you know? And, or this family in Memphis you've never heard of who's adopted this black child off the streets. Really? Like, that's going to be a book? Uh, so craft right now, you'd never write a, anything on craft. The new, the NFL owner? Yes. The spy interests me. So uh, the the craft uh, he doesn't interest me. I mean, I think he the spy interests. Yeah, I mean that right. that whole scene is pretty wild. Huh? It is wild. It is wild. I mean, it is. Um, I'm writing a television show now. It's a pilot for a TV show. Uh, and there's so much, it's, it's about the market for Cuban baseball players from, that's set from like, 1994 <coughs> to 2005 when there was just a black market in human beings. And even guys who got to the big leagues still felt like they were slaves because their families were being held hostage in the Cancun. And you know, Puig, the Dodgers uh, left fielder, um, even as he's playing for the Dodgers, he's being sent like the thumb of his cousin in the mail. From, from the smugglers who smuggled him out because he hadn't paid them that, you know, that month's rent. Uh, and the stories of the women in the spa reminded me of the Cuban baseball players. Like these people, these people who were kind of slaves and were supposed to be, supposed to be a free society. Um, and nobody, they're all vanished, right? Yeah. All, the particular women involved are all gone. God knows where. Yeah. So, uh, but... But that'll, that'll have to settle down a bit before I go and knock on the door. Okay. And I have to make I sure that no, I have to make sure there no cameras story. there when I do. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, our last question, and um, which will bring us back to our first subject. Uh, hello, hello, Mr. Lewis. Uh, my name is Oceanus. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is a little bit more open-ended. Um, a lot of writers have different things to say about their profession. So I'm curious, if you were speaking with a college student who was an aspiring writer, uh, would you tell them that they'd better learn to make a good espresso? <laughs> uh, what advice would you give them? So um, everybody who gives that advice is gonna be giving it from the place that they personally come from. Um, the, and I come from a very unusual place, I think, in that I did not know I wanted to do this until quite late in the game. And then it all just worked out, which doesn't also normally happen. Um, the first thing I'd say is I, I can remember the people, I went to Princeton, and there were a whole bunch of people in my class, many of whom were my friends, who imagined they were going to be writers. None of them became writers. None of them. Uh, and they all wore black turtlenecks and black jeans, and they smoked Galois, and they sat in the corner, and life was so complicated. And if they, if you were happy, it was it, you were stupid. Uh, and it was like you know, you know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, a song. <laughs> and uh, they didn't actually want to write; they wanted to be writers. So what I would say is, make sure you want to write. It's very prosaic. You want to, you're a craftsman, not an artist. Uh, you, you're you're going to do a job. Uh, make sure you actually enjoy the process of putting the words on the page. If that is like, if you can't do that, you're not going to be a writer. A lot of people want to be a writer. I never wanted to be a writer. It's kind of funny. I wanted to write. 
And I think that helps to mm -hmm. want to write. And so that's the first piece of advice is that. Make sure you're the first, not the second. You want to write, not be a writer. The second thing is um, go do stuff that has nothing to do with writing. Take weird jobs. Make an espresso. Go, you know, you know, work at sea for six months. Do, do stuff because it's amazing how much easier it is to write if you have something to write about, something you've experienced. Experiences is just really work. And after the fact, writers often cover up the experiences that led to the work. And the work just sits there magically. But if you dig down underneath any really good book, you often find some really hard earned kind of knowledge, uh, understanding, that someone's had some experience. Uh, you know, Michael Harry didn't just write dispatches. He was in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, the, 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 just generally, this is true. Uh, so when, you, and when you're 21 years old, nobody's gonna, you could do anything. I mean, it's just kind of great how you can float around the world and live on nothing and not have to worry too much about uh, how you're going to make a living. And that, per graduate. that period is a very valuable period, I think. So, to, you know, take odd jobs. Do, you know, I think you, just, you will find stuff. It'll help you find stuff to write about. And the third, so the third thing I'd say is in the service of finding out if you want to write as opposed to be a writer, write letters. Like, write, write letters to people you're fond of, uh, your mom, a friend, and see if they enjoy your letters. Uh, it's a good start. And if they start passing your letters around because they find them so interesting, that's a, that's a good sign. Uh, just old-fashioned letters on paper. And they had an exercise. They had to write a letter. Is that a, the it's, students. They, do they know how to do it? Uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> It's, it's an art. And how they, a lot of people hadn't written letters right. for a long time, if ever, right? So we had to it's, work I miss, on it. This is the price of email. It, it, email is really great for some things, but you really don't want to put too much in an email. In a, you, uh, I mean, it's true that your mom could take a picture of your letter and put it on the internet, <laughs> but, but, but it's, it's more of a private communication. It's more like, it's a it's a it's a very useful form uh, to explore writing, um, and so it, it, that's funny you made them do it. It's a it's a good exercise. Yeah. Did they have to send it, or was it just like to a, to an imaginary friend? Well, they wrote a letter to Jim Fingal, who visited our class, oh, I see. and so they had to write him a letter. Oh, poor Jim Fingal. He, had he to didn't write get all the back. letter. Oh, he didn't. No, uh -huh. we got the letter. Oh. But, um, and we read the letters, but it was a writing a letter about what happened, their experience, their questions. Huh. They had to use the right form, right? So let's, let's open up the floor for a few more questions. I'm sure everyone's ready, even though the room is beautiful, it's getting dark. And um, the microphone will be handed around. Um, do you want me to? Is that all your students? No, there are a lot of them over okay. there. How did you decide who got to ask questions? They decided for themselves. They self-selected. Did they? They were, you were, allowed, they, were, you were, they were picking six amongst themselves? Who was the seventh who got shut out? Well, no, 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 nobody got shut out. Two people, all right, I'm telling the truth now, right? Everyone was given the possibility to ask a question. Right. Then you had to revise your question. So you had to get through that. Then you had it to want to These speak in call. public. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, so it was like they had to run a race. Right. But they wanted to speak in public too. We lost some people because of um, travel, mm. illness, feeling they weren't going to revise well enough to be public. Right. Is that okay? That's fine. <laughs> but I'm just thinking there might be. It's actually the eighth person back there who's just dying to ask. Is there anyone question. who wanted? I know Stephen, but you don't want to. <laughs> You were going to, but you don't want to. Anybody from class? There you go. Oh, yeah, I never heard back. Yeah. Caroline? Oh, here, right here. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Well, I, it's not perfectly revised, but um, <laughs> I, I kind of a question about movies and like seeing your work get adapted into movie form. Um, 
Was there ever a moment when, like, basically, how involved were you in that process, in the adaptation process? And then, um, if you were involved, did you ever see something get adapted kind of problematically? And did you feel, like, how did you feel in that moment? So I I, I, I've only had three. I've had three books that have been adapted in movies: The Blind Side, The Big Short, and Moneyball. There are a few more that are in the works right now, but uh, various stages. Obama bought The Fifth Risk, and. Obama, Michelle, and Barack bought it for their Netflix platform because for, it's going to be a funny kind of documentary to essentially produce a civics lesson about how the government works. Wow. Um, but the um, so the, the truth, the absolute truth about Hollywood is they would much prefer the author be dead uh, <laughs> because the the living author is nothing but trouble. Uh, there's no upside. They got the book. They, want it, they don't want the book, you know, they want the material from the book, but they don't really want people to remember the book exists they, because they would like it to be their money ball, their blind side, not mine. And they're also, in the back of their minds, they're aware that you might come out and say that you ruined their work, of, they ruined your work of art. Um, and I've never felt that way. I felt like if I'm, they're paying me money for the thing, they can do whatever they want. And I tell them, you can do whatever you want, don't call me. <laughs> they're very uncomfortable with that because uh, they, they're afraid you don't mean it. They, they're afraid that it's going to come out and you're going to say they weren't supposed to do that. So what happens is they drag you in in this phony relationship <laughs> and they pretend to be interested in what you say and you have to pretend to be interested, they believe that they're interested. In, and, and so, but because you're actually physically together and you're on the set and you have dinner with a director and all that, um, there's a chance a relationship starts. Uh, and in every case, relationship starts. So I'm friends with all the directors of the, and some of the writers and some of the actors. And, and I really like them all. I mean, I've been so lucky with the talent that's been thrown at my books. Um, and I had no problem with really any of it. I thought each one, in a way, has been better than the last, and then each one has been even less plausible as a movie. Than the last, the Blind Side. There was a movie in there waiting just to happen, uh, and it was an emotional family story, uh, mother son drama. Uh, the 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 money money ball, the Big Short. I mean, I told them you shouldn't even be trying, and I couldn't believe that they were going to try to do this, and I was amazed by how good they were. So it's been it's totally fun, nothing but upside, and I don't feel like I'm implicated. I don't I don't feel like my work is in any way. Affected. It sells a lot of books. That's nice, um, but it, I don't feel. I feel sometimes I learn something about the book. Um, I think I'll give you an example um, with the Big Short. Christian Bale played uh, Michael Burry, who was a, a, a hedge fund manager with Aspergers in San Jose, and attributed some of his success, his ability to see the financial crisis coming, to the fact he had no, almost no social interaction with anybody on Wall Street. So he didn't listen to the lies. Uh, he, he, he tried to think for himself. Michael Burry has, uh, it's not a very awkward social manner, but a little bit of an awkward social manner. And I, I adore him. I think he's wonderful. But he is just a little different when you're with him. And I, di I didn't make a huge effort. I don't even remember if I made any effort to t try to describe what he was like just physically. Christian Bale spends one day with him, but it's an intense day. He shows up at 8 in the morning and leaves at 8 at night, and Michael Berry swears he didn't even get up to go to the bathroom and just grills Michael for the 12 hours. And at the end of it says, can I have those shorts and that T-shirt you're wearing? <laughs> and uh, he ship them to me. And he wears them through the movie. Uh, and it was to happen to be the shorts and the T-shirt he was wearing when I met him. Uh, <laughs> when I saw Christian Bale, I, I, I couldn't believe, I, I thought I was watching Michael Burry. It was that shockingly right in a way that I could not, because I did not, or I did not, do on the page. I did not describe that. So this actor has gone in and in a day done something with this person that I didn't do in a year of marinating in his life. I went, after the movies are made, um, they asked me to go help sell them. 
So I will go on the junket with the actors and the director. And so I spend some time with them then and have a chance to talk to them. And I was cornering Christian Bale everywhere we went and asking him, how'd you do it? Like, what, what was that? And he was kind of like, ah, it's no big deal, man. Relax, chill, don't bother me. Uh, and, and I bothered him enough that he finally said, all right, I, you know, I, I, this is what we did. He said, if you just watch him, he breathes in the wrong places. This gets back to the, uh, the audible thing. Uh, when he's speaking, we all breathe when we're speaking so we don't die. And, uh, and he breathes in the wrong places and sentences. And if you do that, all the body mannerisms follow. And so I would tell Adam McKay, when I go on set, make sure I'm breathing in the wrong place. And everything else will work. Now, that's genius. I mean, that's just genius. Now, it, it made me think, what else did I miss? Uh, if, so that's, that side of it actually is interesting. Watching these people hack away at the material you hacked away at, and they are ingenious. And they are, you know, the wrong, the, the misperception of Hollywood is it's just a lot of glitter. I can understand. There's incredible craftsmanship in that place. Uh, and I have an intersect with it. So it's been, a, it's been like a total pleasure. <laughs> Give me some uh, slack. But um, you often think of certain writers really of a place. So Tom Wolfe in New York, Mark Twain in Hannibal, Missouri, and the Mississippi. You were born in Louisiana. You were in New York when you wrote Liar's Poker. You're now here. What of Berkeley? Is, are you of this place? And I mean both UC Berkeley and Berkeley. And if so, what has it done for you as a storyteller and right. writer? Um, so I'm very much from New Orleans very much from New Orleans. Uh, my family's been there since Thomas Jefferson sent my Lewis ancestor down to receive the purchase, Louisiana Purchase from the French in 1803, and he became, Joshua Lewis, became the first Chief Justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court. He wrote all the original legal opinions, and his son was the mayor of New Orleans, and I, my mother's story is a similar kind of story. And so my family, and my family's never left. So I go there, I'm related to everybody. I know, I'm just, I'm the only one who got out. An uncle and, an, and a cousin married Brazilian women and moved to Rio, which is a much more natural move than going to New York. I mean, the, the thing about New Orleans, it really yeah. is true. The, southern, the northernmost city in, uh, in, in South America, not the southernmost city in, nor in North America. And um, so that's in my blood in a way no other place is. I wrote Liar's Poker in London. London had a big effect on my writing life because I was swimming in these, this pool of very talented, crisp uh, British writers who say what they mean much better than we do. Uh, they often, they also put a lot of bullshit in print that they shouldn't, that we don't, but they, they do, they, they re, it is instructive to be writing for British editors. Um, I never, but no place ever was home but New Orleans, ever. I lived in Washington and in New York, in Tokyo for six months. No place ever was home until here. And we moved here in we, 97, 98, 98. My wife, we came out because my wife had a fellowship at Stanford for a year. We came to a dinner party at Berkeley. Orville Schell, who was the dean of the journalism school, was at the dinner party. So you guys ought to come and spend a year teaching at the journalism school. Teaching was a strong word for what I did. It's not what I did. I presided. But, uh, but I was working on a book about Silicon Valley, and we said, sure. And we got here, and after about a few months, it just felt, it felt right. And we, my wife got pregnant, and we thought, where do we want to raise children? We just want to be in one place. And it just it was kind of a, little, a little odd that we just said, we're just going to stay here. We, we knew we didn't want to go to New York. That was a negative decision. She knew she wasn't going to come with me to New Orleans. So it was like... Let's try it. And uh, has it, so it became home. It is, it feel, and it's taught me what, what, what creates that feeling of home. It isn't having really, having a few close friends. It's having this vast network of a casual acquaintances that you develop when you have kids in a place. That through the softball leagues and the soccer leagues and the schools, and you're thrown into it in a way that you were thrown into life in your childhood, and you just get to start to know people in the grocery store, you know. And um, and I think this place resonated with me 
for two reasons. One is the up in the hills here, the air reminds me, we used to spend our summers in the mountains of North Carolina. The air reminds me of that air. Hmm. It feels like mountain air. And I just felt, it's, the smell is slightly different, but not that different. Um, so it felt like home for that reason. And the other thing is, there are not many places in this country that tolerate the range of behavior on the streets that both <laughs> New Orleans and Berkeley do. Now, in, in Berkeley, the person who's walking down the street naked is naked because he got some theory about why it should be okay to be naked on the street. <laughs> it is, it may, it's a political act. In New Orleans, they're walking down the street naked because it's hot and they just felt like it. But, but in both places, there is a structure in place to accommodate that naked person. And, uh, and that um, really felt right to me. It still feels right. How it's affected my writing is, more, is not so much who I am, because who I am really goes back to New Orleans. Uh, it's more um, the material that's accessible to me. One of the things, items on the checklist when we were kind of thinking about where could we live, is I did say it would be nice to live in a place where so much is happening. I'll know some of my book material is within driving distance rather than a flight distance. And if you think about what's happened since we set foot, foot here, I've written the new, new thing, Moneyball, Oakland A's, the, the big short, two thirds of the uh, main characters, two or three main characters, Berkeley and San Jose. Um, the Undoing Project, Danny Common lived up the hill, and Amos Tversky was a professor at Stanford, and his papers were there. I mean, it, it's remarkable how much literary material there is. I mean, just stuff is happening. Uh, and, and so that has been fantastic. Uh, that's been just great. And I just love it here. I mean, we never live in it. I, I'm being carried out feet for, freight first. The university is very, very important to me. Um, but not because I'm ever here. I mean, I walk across the campus to get to places, and I walk around the campus, and I use the, the journalism school to record my podcast and to do TV and radio, and, but I don't do that. I haven't done very much of this at all, like interacting with the students, except trying not to hit them on the crosswalks, because they are, you're absolutely suicidal, right? You all have death wishes. You do know we have the highest rate in the state of pedestrians being hit by cars, and you do realize that you are to blame. Uh, but, but anyway, that's an aside. That's an aside. I, rec I respect pedestrian rights. You're the sacred cows of our time. But, but They're the, usually talking to their parents. Yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> yes, but, 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 but the, 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 what this place does, it turns a small town into not a small town. University towns are the best places to live because you get the benefits of small town life without the cost. You get this churn and you get really interesting people who are either passing through or based here. And like one, there's a sliver of my life. If everyone was ever right about how my books came to pass in the last 15 years, you couldn't do it without going to Cesar's, the bar, and talking to the guy who makes me Sazerax, uh, and, and, and asking, how often is he in here and who is he talking to? Because I'm in there talking, I have one in particular, Dacker Keltner, who's a psychology professor, I, I run all my stuff by him. He's my sounding board. Uh, and he's here because of this, you know? And I have a couple other friends who are professors who are just like, they wouldn't be here if there wasn't a university here. So this place is really important to me. Um, two left, we'll take two questions. And I think, yes, sir. Uh, this sort of is tangent, it's tangentially related to the, the question about movies, but getting back to where you started about audiobooks versus, versus written, and you suggested that the written format is more cerebral and the audio is more emotional, but it seems to me that there's a third element which is different, which and that has to do with imagination. If I read Huckleberry Finn, I imagine what Huck sounds like. If I hear it on audio, somebody's made that decision for me. And I wondered what your thought about that difference was. You know, that's funny you say that, because um, when we're listening to it, the one disappointment in listening to it is the voice of not Huck, but Jim. Reading the voice of Jim, I felt I knew him better than hearing the voice of Jim, uh, oh. back when I read it the first time. So that is true. Um, 
That is true. And when I'm reading the book, I mean, I, I'm, the, I'm the voice of everybody, and that's just not very satisfying, uh, unless it's me. Um, so that's true. There is a, you're, you're absolutely right. That is an, a point of engagement with the imagination that the printed word in a funny way has an advantage over the, over the audio experience. But there's some, it may be something, it may be just something about, you know, I, I don't know, Malcolm Gladwell, who's the editor of my podcast, uh, so he's been, I've been cooking it up with him. Um, he said that when he started doing his podcast, he had this very odd reaction, that it, it, it was as successful as his books. But the kind of reaction he was getting on the streets was instead of people wanting to come up and to sign his books, they want to come and hug him. <laughs> they, 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 they felt like this emotional connection with him. Uh, and I think it's because you're maybe just because you, this is the op you're hearing the voice, you're hearing my voice. Uh, so um, I don't know. It's a fair point. There, there are advantages to each. There are differences. It's and it's just generally, and this is true not just of doing the audiobooks, but also writing the screenplays. It's really useful to me as a writer to to have slightly different forms to play with. Just because it makes you aware, nothing else, it makes you aware of the form you're working in when you have something just a little different. Hmm. Homer might have enjoyed being able to have someone read something he wrote uh, just to see how that was different. It might have informed the way he told his stories. Uh, it's, it's just, it's nice to mix it up so you don't get in a rut. Hi, Michael. My name is Anuj. And often a lot of your books, I've read a couple of your books, and each chapter tends to have an impact on the reader. But a book like The Undoing Project, that's what my question is about. Every chapter has a lesson or a consequence that could possibly change the schema with which you think about your life. Because you're talking about new papers in uh, Kahneman or Tversky's life. So as the author of that book, while researching about that book and while writing that book, amidst the about 50 lessons that came out of that book, what lesson really stuck with you had a profound impact on your life? Because from, personally, I had a lot of lessons from that book. So it would be, be very interesting to know what lesson came out for you that really stuck with you and impacted your life. The Undoing Project um, was the hardest book I've ever written because it was, it was the book where I was so clear in my head that I was not as smart as my subjects. And so I, getting, it was really hard to get my mind around them. Um, I was not, my mind was not able to do what their mind did, which was just not true of the people in sports or Wall Street. It, it, those were, it, was, it was writing about C students rather than A students there. But the, the A, these guys noodled sometimes in formal theories and sometimes just when they were spitballing about how the human mind worked. And the, I, to answer your question, the, the things that stick with me um, from their work that recur to me as I'm just moving through the world. Uh, w the broad lesson they have is that that you know we're we are as we move through the world we're constantly in probabilistic situations that we don't frame as probabilistic situations. We do not think probabilistically. We think in stories. No one ever made a decision because of a number. They make a decision because of a narrative. And what they explored was the way the narrative screwed up systematically. The way people, the systematic mistakes people make when they're telling the stories, how that differs from the probabilities when you can even calculate the probabilities. And uh, from this journey they go on, several things fall out uh, that, I mean, that, that just you see every day. One is, uh, I mean, they put different names to it, but we think in stereotypes. So you have a picture in your head of what a doctor looks like, or a picture in your head of what a book editor looks like. Uh, and you, uh, you're, going to, you're going to misvalue people who don't look the part. So one of the things I have done since, I've been, since I worked on that book is when someone is going to come into my life in a role, if they look the part, I'm more suspicious. And if they don't look the part, I'm less suspicious. Um, a funny example of this is, so uh, this, is, this is stuff that actually, the, 
the guys who ran the Oakland A's were very familiar with it because they were aware that baseball players who looked the part got overvalued and baseball players who didn't look the part got undervalued. And they had gotten so obsessed with this that when they're in their own personal investing, they had found out that like 80% of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were white men who were 6'1 or taller. They refused to invest in companies that had white men who were 6'1 and taller <laughs> as CEOs because the likelihood that they were good at their job was lower. They, likely they were in their job because they looked the part, because they fit the stereotype, as opposed to they were good at their job was lower. So that's effect, you know, I, whenever I find myself succumbing to stereotypes, or we're in a, I, I, I'm aware of the stereotype. I try to be aware of the stereotype. Um, the, uh, the way the mind is distorted by even irrelevant information, uh, it can be anchored by irrelevant information. Trump's a genius at this, throwing out some vast number. And you know it's not true, but your mind creeps towards his number. Uh, there are a million legal people in the caravan, or that kind of stuff. Uh, that it actually has an effect. Um, the the uh, um, the way your mind is distorted by whatever just happened. Um, you. So here's a really simple example, but it's totally true. It's, this is the way it's changed my life. I used to when I drove. I would be more cautious after I saw an accident. You're on the highway, you see carnage on the side of the road, you're reminded this is dangerous, this is a lethal vehicle, you'd slow down. Now I find myself forcing myself to be cautious when there isn't an accident. Uh, and that, because that's when you, st you realize you, you haven't seen an accident in a while, you start to, you know, you're, it's all of a sudden you're going 75 instead of 70. And so just that, that's a metaphor for lots of things that just kind of like trying to keep in mind um, the things that you aren't, that aren't immediately present. And also at the same time, discounting a little bit the things that are immediately present. Uh, so they're just things like that. I think that their work is, their work is, um, I'll give one more example. They didn't even write a paper about this, but this, this is where the book gets its title from, The Undoing Project. They were noodling around with how uh, the human imagination works. And they were using as it, their text uh, regret. How people, when something bad, really bad happens, how people undo the story. So you just hit a Berkeley student on a crosswalk going to the Claremont Hotel. And you know, he was laying prone on the side of the road. And for the, for the, if you're a natural, remorseful, empathetic person, you're not Donald Trump. You're, for, the, for, for a while, you're going to be very disturbed that you hit this person. And you're going to be thinking, how I could have avoided it. If only this. If only, you might even think, if only I'd taken a different route to the Claremont. Um, the, the, what these guys showed is their rules that the mind obeys when it's spinning these fantasies, how it, undo, how it undoes something that it, wish, it wishes undone. And, uh, and it, 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 distorts, it distorts kind of the story, uh, uh, the, your interpretation of the story. You're watching a sports game. Um, let's say the Super Bowl. How many people watch the Super Bowl or knows what happened in the Super Bowl? All right, at the end of the Super Bowl is a penalty uh, that didn't get called. And if the penalty had gotten called, Probably the Saints, not the Super Bowl, the game before the Super Bowl, NFC Championship. The Saints would have won and gone on. All of New Orleans is in the streets protesting during the Super Bowl because of this call two weeks before. Refused to watch the Super Bowl. All blaming it on the thing that happened at the end of the game. God help the person who screws up at the end of the game as opposed to the person who screws up at the beginning. You can screw up 10 times worse at the beginning of the game and nobody remembers. At the end, the thing that happens immediately before the disaster always gets undue weight placed on it. So this is why kickers end up lynching themselves, right? At the end, when they miss a game, they miss a kick at the end of the game. Um, so just, they, just more generally, kind of made me aware of all the funny things my mind is doing that are the illusions, the magic tricks it's playing on me all the time, and you try to kind of just counteract them. Thank you so much. I think we should end. Thank you for an amazing. Thanks for having me.